What I'm preaching on today is lessons on boldness. Now, we're not doing a scripture reading because I'm actually going to go through some passages in Daniel. I wanted to look at the stories in Daniel. They may be very familiar to you who have read through the Bible and are very familiar with the stories in Daniel. Hopefully, when we go through the stories today, there'll be some things that you haven't thought about or some things you've missed as we go through them. And I'll give you my thoughts uh, on these stories in Daniel. So mainly we're going to look at chapter 1, chapter 3, and chapter 6 because those are really the famous stories of Daniel and his friends taking a stand for God. So I want us to go through that this morning and be encouraged by their example. Um, just a story before I get into the sermon. Um, and it really isn't related to boldness at all, but um, every time I, I think of the book of Daniel, I just think back to my days uh, when I was going to a youth group back at the Bible Presbyterian Church because the first youth group I was a part of, and this is when I was just newly saved, I was getting into church, and I was just starting to learn the Bible, hadn't read through it at all, was not familiar with any of the stories at all. And so sometimes we, when, when you get familiar with the stories, you, you forget how interesting they are to people that don't know these stories. And I remember when I first joined that youth group, uh, the, they would name the different care groups, right? They would name the different care groups after different things in the Bible. And Daniel was our theme for that year. So we were learning about Daniel. There were three care groups, so we were named after Daniel's three friends, right? Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. Uh, and I was in um, the group Azariah. That was my group. And, you know, as you do in youth group, you have like these care group outings. And I remember going to the park and learning about the life of Daniel. And when I heard these stories for the first time, it, I just remember it blew my mind where I was, I was thinking like, is this, because we were going through this story and, and, and they were explaining to me what was happening in Daniel. And I was saying, is this actually in the Bible? Like, I can't believe a story like this is actually in the Bible. And that's sort of what prompted me as well to sort of like read through it. Because I was just thinking, man, if this story is in the Bible, what other stories are in there that are really interesting? And there's a lot of interesting stories in the Bible. And if you're not reading your Bible, you're not reading through it, you don't know a lot of these stories. Obviously, through the preaching, you learn about some of these stories. And maybe if you grew up in Sunday school, you would have learned a bit about these stories. But make sure you go back and read them yourself because you're actually getting the true, the full story from, the, from God himself. And you're not getting, you know, maybe one, one person's interpretation of it or a watered down version of it in Sunday school. You actually go through it all. Uh, so anyways, the book of Daniel has that sort of place in my heart. Whenever I think of the book of Daniel, I always think of that first youth group I was in, that first care group I was in. And just remember my eyes being open to like, wow, like some of these stories are, are really interesting in the Bible. So let's start off in chapter 1. <clears throat> So we're going to uh, look at lessons on boldness from the book of Daniel. And the first story we go to is when Daniel purposes in his heart not to eat the king's meat. So we'll just go over the story first and then a few practical applications from the, from the chapter. So Daniel 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Neb Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. So this is now the captivity of, of uh, Judah, right? Because you have Israel and Judah at the time. So Daniel's story takes place when they're in captivity now. So they've, they've gone into captivity because of the sins of Judah and they're being oppressed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So this is now uh, Nebuchadnezzar, obviously, you know, taking a lot of the gold and gifts and stuff from God's house, because obviously he at this point in time is not a, is not a uh, Bible believer. Uh, I believe later on in Daniel, he does get saved, but at this time, no, he's just a pagan king. And the king spake unto Aphanaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favoured and skilful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. So you see, they've gone into captivity. And what the Babylonians are doing now is they're taking the best of 
the children of Judah, right? And they're going to teach them in the ways of the Chaldeans. And now what I think of when I think of this scenario and how we can apply it to today is that's what the world and Satan wants to do with our kids, right? They want to take our kids and indoctrinate them in the ways of the world. That's why it's very dangerous when you send your kids to a public school because you're going basically to the world. You're going to the government and saying, teach my children whatever you want to teach them. And this is what Satan tries to do. He tries to get God's children's children right to affect the next generation and that's why here they're trying to take the best of the children of judah because that why they're going to be the next leaders in the next generation they're going to try and influence them because that's how they obviously influence society so there's a very concerted effort here and obviously babylon representing the world's kingdoms the kingdoms of satan and judah representing god's people in oppression how we would see ourselves today so just be careful there um, that's definitely the agenda of the world even though uh, you know it's not overt and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat so these children are in captivity uh, Judah's in captivity these children are taken saying hey we're going to teach them in the ways of the Chaldeans so not only that they're given a portion of meat the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them for three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king so they're going to feed them chaldean food the food from the king and his drink they're going to teach them in the ways and in three years they're going to stand before the king to see how they fare now among these were of the children of judah daniel hananiah mishael and azariah so this is where we we find these characters in the bible so not only are they taught in the ways of the chaldeans but we see in the next verse unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names for he gave unto daniel the name of belteshazzar and to hananiah of shadrach and to mishael of meshach and to azariah of abednego so not only were they taught in the ways or given different things to eat they even gave them a different identity they renamed them chaldean you know babylonian names and took away their hebrew names and look here it says here in verse 8 but daniel purposed in his heart they would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself now why would you know uh, it doesn't really tell us here why daniel didn't want to eat of the king's meat and drink but it's likely likely the reason why he did not want to eat of the king's meat and drink is because it was offered to idols you know chances are you know the babylonian pagan empire they're offering this food and this drink to idols um, and that's likely the reason why daniel doesn't want to eat this he wants to take this stand so he requests uh portion of the king nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself now god had brought daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs and the prince of the eunuchs said unto daniel I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king what is the what, so there's somebody that's in charge of these children and there's probably different groups there's this one eunuch who's in charge of the group that includes daniel and his three friends and basically what he's saying to daniel like if you're not going to eat this stuff because he because he because daniel's obviously has a relationship with this guy looking after him He's saying, if you're not going to eat this stuff, when I present you to the king in three years and you guys are all like, you might die. or just, like, I'm going to be in trouble, right? Because I'm responsible to make sure that you guys are taught in the ways and you guys are looking good to stand in the palace in three years. Then said Daniel to Melzar, so that's his name, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Prove thy servants. So this is Daniel's plan now. He says, prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days and let them give us pulse to eat so pulse is like a like a bean mixture like beans basically and water to drink so he's just going to eat beans and water then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat as thou seest deal with thy servant so he's saying hey we're just going to eat pulse and drink water and then compare us after three years to those who do eat the king's meat and the drink so he melzar consented to them in this matter he says all right let's try this for 10 days 10 days first 
He proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge. So God blesses them for taking this stand. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So it was because of this stand that they took. This was the reason why God gave them this wisdom and why Daniel even progressed in the Babylonian Empire. Because it was, it was because of his interpretation of dreams. You see, we're not going to go to Daniel 2, but go back and read it later. But it was because he was enabled, able not only... And I don't know if you know this about... You, we know Daniel interpreted dreams, but you know what makes Daniel's uh, dream interpretation so crazy? If you go back and read chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, when he has this dream, he doesn't even remember what he dreamed, if you know the story. So he has a dream, he doesn't even remember what he dreamed, and then he tells his wise men, you're not only going to tell me the interpretation of the dream, you have to tell me what I dreamed. And then the, the wise men are like, who can do that, right? Because it's like, we don't even know what you dreamed, how are we going to tell you what it means? And then he gets angry with them, right? So that's when Daniel goes, oh, we'll tell the king what he dreamed. And then he goes and prays to God, saying, God, like, reveal to us this dream. So then it's revealed to Daniel, the dream about the statue. And that's why Daniel is promoted in the kingdom in, in verse 2. So anyways, th this is the reason why, though, he has this wisdom. Right? So he wasn't, it's like he wasn't born with that wisdom. Right? He wasn't just given to it already. He took the stand first. Right? He purposed in his heart, he's going to take a stand for God. Then God gave him the wisdom. Right? So it's not that you say, because you know when people think about going soul winning, they're like, I'm going to wait right, till I know everything, I'm comfortable, I, I know what I'm going to say, then I'm going to go out and serve God. That's not how it works. So you take the stand first. You say, you know what? I'm going to purpose in my heart, take a stand for God, do what's right. Then you start growing right, and you're learning and then God gives you that wisdom. Why? Because now you're walking in the Spirit. And you're going to be learning things from the Holy Spirit. Now, at the end of the days that the king had said, bring them in, then the princes of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of Cyrus. Now, just a few things from that chapter. One thing is, we can see here from Daniel chapter 1, when these guys were brought into captivity, they were kids. Right? Sometimes we think of Daniel as like adults. Maybe we picture you reading Daniel 1, you're picturing in your head these older people, people your age. No, these were kids. We don't know how old, how old they were, but they're referred to as children. So when Daniel first took the stand, we can see here, you don't have to be old to take a stand for God. You don't have to be an adult. You can be a child and take a stand for God. And that's why Daniel is such a good example, not only to the older generation, but also a great example to the younger generation. Say, look, even if all your friends, kids, are doing the wrong things. I mean, how many people, how many children of Judah were brought into captivity? You think there was only four? Now, there were a lot of kids brought into captivity from Judah, but how many took a stand for God? Four of them, right? Just think of the, the social pressure, right? The, the, the peer pressure of all these kids doing it. But Daniel, he purposes in his heart not to devile himself. And they were kids, so that's one thing. You can be, you can be a child and take a stand for God. And, and likewise, there's so many people, so many children of Judah that were taken into captivity that didn't take this stand. So when we're thinking about how to be bold for Christ, don't expect that you're always going to be part of the crowd. Don't always expect that you're always going to be standing with many people. If you expect sometimes to be standing alone, which we see in the book of Daniel, then you won't be discouraged when you are alone or when there are a few of you taking a stand. Right? So that's just how we can have expectations when we're trying to be bold for the Lord. But not only that, remember Daniel purposed in his heart? So when it comes to boldness, you're not just bold automatically. It doesn't just accidentally happen. I was just accidentally bold for the Lord. No, it's something that you decide beforehand. 
And if you don't purpose beforehand and re be resolved in your mind beforehand to take a stand for God, you know when, when, the, when the hard times come, when you need to take a stand, you're not going to take the stand. So it has to happen in your heart first, just like with Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart first to say, you know what, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat. So when the time came to stand, he was resolute about it as opposed to wish being wishy-washy. And too many Christians are wishy-washy in their stand. They don't know where they stand. They haven't really decided, you know, do I really, people want me to know, do I want people to know that I'm a Christian? You know, you're fearful. So if you just purpose in your heart, you know, I'm going to take this stand, that's one way that will help you to be bold. And if you do, if you are bold, you can affect your friends. You see, who was the one that purposed in his heart to not defile the king's meat? It doesn't say that all of them purposed in their heart. But when Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat, guess what? Three of his friends all of a sudden had the boldness as well to do the same. Now, obviously, ideally, they would all be like Daniel. But the reality of it is, if one person takes a stand for God, that encourages other people to take a stand for God as well. And just like you are probably encouraged by me taking a stand for God, you know there are people in your circle of influence. Don't think that you do not influence people. There are people that you will influence, your friends, your family. You know what, if you take a stand for God, they might take a stand for God too. Right? So we've got to think about our impact on other people. And you know what, we see that if you do take a stand for God, you will be rewarded. Hey, it may not be a reward in this life. Here we see Daniel is given wisdom and knowledge that definitely will come. But in terms of other rewards, there will be rewards waiting for you in heaven. So there will be a reward for those that take a stand for God. So that's some lessons from chapter 1. Let's go to chapter 3 where we look at the fiery furnace. The story of the fiery furnace. Now think about this. In chapter 1, Daniel's the one that takes the stand. He encourages his friends, right? Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael to take a stand as well. Chapter 2, we see because of the wisdom that they were given from God, because of that, uh, that stand that they took, they were promoted into the kingdom. Now we get to Daniel chapter 3, where it's not about Daniel. Now it's just about Daniel's three friends. Now this time, they've been promoted into the kingdom. Now they are over provinces within Babylon, and they are asked to do something sinful. Here it says here in Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. So this huge golden statue. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the princes to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So he calls all his nobles, right? So this includes Daniel's three friends, right? Because they are set over some of the provinces as well. They're all called together. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together into the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image <coughs> that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now one thought I have I don't know when they're all called to this dedication that they knew what they were being called for, right? So I don't know whether they're given the memo beforehand to say, you know, hey, you're going to come to this dedication for this golden image. I have a feeling they didn't know. They were just called by the king. They're like, hey, the king's called us for a meeting. Because chances are if the three men had known that's what they were being called for, they may not have even gone to begin with, right? But the fact that they're there, I think... That they were called they didn't know what they were going for and then they realized when they get there it's a dedication for this golden image that's that's why they're even there that's that's my thought and why because then a herald cried aloud to you it is commanded O people nations and languages this is how i see it. it's like they're called and this is the announcement of wait this is what you guys are going to have to do right O people nations and languages that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet flute, harp, and sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. 
And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, so these are different instruments, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now sometimes we read over this story, or we're familiar about this story, and we don't really think about the enormity of what these men have just did, have just done. Because if you think about it, if you, think about it if you were put in that situation. If you were put in a situation where you are called to something, they're all the nobles, all the people that are respected in society, and they are told, you are going to bow down and worship this image, and if you don't, you are going to be killed. I mean, how many of us would buckle under that pressure? I mean, would you be ready to take a stand, to lose your life, to stand there, you know? And generally, if, if you are called to something and you knew it was going to happen, you may have time to, like, prepare yourself to say, you know, when I go there, I'm going to take a stand. You, you ready yourself. But this is not this situation, right? They're called there and it's all of a sudden just sprang on them. It's like, you're, you have to worship this golden image and if you don't, you're going to be thrown into the midst of a burning fiery furnace so it's amazing that even in that environment they take the stand that they do so this is what's happening in this chapter if you're not catching it basically nebuchadnezzar builds this golden image he says hey when we play the music everyone's going to bow down and worship this this uh, this statue and if you don't you're going to be thrown into a burning fiery furnace that's what's happening here now the three friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say no. They stand up. They don't bow. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? So now it's brought to the boss. So you, it's like you can imagine at work. Maybe work asks you to do things, and, and nobody really knows. Like maybe just your colleagues know that you're not complying. Right? And you can kind of get away with it, and it's like, I feel like I'm not really taking a bold stand, but then maybe it comes up to the boss, to the CEO. You, or you're called into HR, right? HR calls you in and says, is this true? Is this what you've been doing? Is this what you've been saying? This is the situation here now, right? Nebuchadnezzar comes to them and says, is it true you're not complying with company policy, right? Now you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the corn. He's saying, I'm going to give you another chance, right, to recant. Maybe you just didn't understand what I asked you to do, right? What is expected of you as a, as a faithful employee, right? Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have set up. Well, saying that's good. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And, and I love the response of Shadrach. Me. Every time I read through this passage, it just gives me shivers that they had such boldness to do what they did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. He's saying, we're not concerned about how we're going to tell you what we're going to do in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. They're saying, hey, even if you throw us into that fiery furnace, God will deliver us. 
But this is the chilling part. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But look at verse 18. Look at their attitude. But if not, even if God doesn't deliver us out of the fiery furnace, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then when Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed, what does it say? His face changed. Maybe it was being a bit, hey, you know, you, know, you guys uh, maybe just missed the memo. And then when they realized they didn't miss the memo, it's like, you know. <laughs> Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. So he's saying, I'm going to heat this furnace up seven times more than I normally heat it up. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. So take note that these are not weak, piddly men that are binding them up and throwing them in. These are strong men. Now why that's important? Because it says, then these men, so then uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel's three friends, bound in their coats, their hose, and their hats, and their other garments, were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. But look at this. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent. Why? Because he wants it done right now. And the furnace, exceeding hot. Look at this. The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know if you realize that. Because they heated up the furnace so hot that the mighty men that bound up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and went to throw them into the fire, they were killed trying to throw them into the fire because the furnace was so hot. So because some people try and explain away this story to say, oh, maybe there were cold spots in there and you know, they were thrown in, but there was a cold spot in the furnace. There's no cold spot in the furnace because the people that weren't even in the furnace died, right? Outside of the furnace. And these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Now, I don't even realize that when they were thrown in, they were bound, right? So they're like, you know, go in. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. So, right, so the people, mighty men throw them into the fire, but now the king looks in and says, didn't we throw three men into the fire? He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. So you know what's interesting there? Is that I always pictured like they were thrown in the fire and they're kind of like, oh, what's going on? We're not getting burnt. But what is actually happening is they're bound. They're thrown into the fire. And obviously their ropes don't get burned because their clothes didn't get burned. So what actually happened? Jesus actually unties them. <laughs> Right, because God is in there in the furnace with them. So it's interesting that it's like He unties them. Um, well, that's what I'm assuming, right? It's not the same, but they're loose. So now they're untied. They're no longer bound. Now they're walking in the midst of the fire. So I wonder if, because we, we know that the burning fiery furnace pictures being saved from hell, but you know, maybe the fact that they're bound is kind of like our salvation, right? Like our salvation, we're captive to sin. So Jesus looses them from their bind, and then they can then. The fire can represent obviously hell, but it can also represent persecution from the world. So not only are we saved from hell, which is what people think of when they think of the fiery furnace, but we are saved and now we are unaffected if we walk with Jesus from the persecution in the world, right? In the fiery furnace. Fiery furnace. Walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So that's how we know that's Jesus Christ in there with them. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and kings, counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, look at this, upon whom the bodies of the fire had no power. See, oftentimes we are scared of taking a stand for God. But you know what? We don't need to be scared of what they can do to us because, yeah, they can kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. And this is meant to be an example to us that if you take a stand, you know, we can be persecuted and we can be insulted, but, you know, you, you can only just let that affect you. If you don't let that affect you, really it has no effect on you if you have the right mindset and you're walking with Jesus Christ. So the fire had no power. 
nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed. Look at this. Nor the smell of fire had passed on them. So you see how, how protected they were from the fire. It's saying not even a, even a little bit of their hair was singed, but not even the smell of the smoke was on their clothes when they came out. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So a few lessons there. It's just interesting that you know, we're talking about taking a bold stand, some of the things hopefully you didn't know about the story there that might have been new to you. But one thing we can learn from this is, you know, when you take a stand for God, sometimes you think taking a stand for God or making people know what you believe or, you know, you, you, you um, uh, yeah, you take, you take a stand for God. I, I don't know what, I'm, what words I'm trying to look for. You think that you will lose respect in the eyes of the world. But often I found in my experience, yeah, there are the scoffers out there and the people that don't care about things. But you know what? When you, when you take a stand for God, even people that are unbelievers that are in the world tend to respect people for that. Have you ever seen that? Where people may not agree with what you believe, but they respect the fact that you're taking a stand for what you believe. So you may think, you may not be bold because you're thinking, oh, you know, what are people going to think of me? They think this. I don't want people to know. But if you have that attitude, you will actually have less respect in people's eyes than if you just are open about what you believe and you just know what you believe and you're bold in what you believe. Generally, the world actually respects that. And I even think about back when, and I might have told you this story before, but I remember back when I was working uh, in Phoenix and I was working in uh, the uh, Fry's Electronics. And I remember there was a discussion just amongst the salespeople about the Bible and about God. And, uh, you know, my manager was sort of, you know, scoffing at the Bible and saying, oh, you know what, the Bible's just fairy tales and stuff like that. And I, I just mentioned to him, you know, like, I, you know, the Bible is, you know, scientifically accurate. And yeah, I, I can't remember exactly all the things I said to him. But I just said to him, like, I don't think the Bible's silly at all. I think it's got this. I don't think it's got this wisdom and stuff like that. And uh, we went a bit back and forth. And... I didn't think it really had any effect on him at all. But then later on, we were talking, I was sharing the gospel with him, and I actually ended up getting this manager saved, you know, and actually being able to pray with him and call upon the name of the Lord. And I asked him, like, what made you, like, just reconsider these things? Because not long ago, you were, like, scoffing at the Bible and what that. And he said, you know what, when you, st when you took that bold stand, he was saying to me, like, it just struck me that I've always scoffed at the Bible, and, and people, nobody's ever defended it. But when you sort of spoke up and defended it, it just sort of made me rethink things. So, so that just blew my mind because I had no idea that it had that effect on him. Because I just thought, like, I just had this argument. Because it was just like, you know, you're working, right? And it was just like we'd gathered around and somebody said something and I just, I just said something and then we just went back to work. And I just thought it was just like a passing comment. But the fact that I took that stand and I said something, it made a difference to how he perceived Christianity. It made him rethink. Because obviously he was Mexican. He was grow, grew up as a Catholic. So he had some respect for the Bible. But I think he had been scoffing at it for so long and nobody had ever taken that stand. And I just think we can have that impact on people if we are willing to be bold and speak up sometimes. And obviously speak up respectfully and with love. So if you think you're going to be less respected, oftentimes if you are bold in your stance, you will actually have more respect in the world. Don't expect the right thing to be the easiest thing to do. So when we talk about taking a bold stand for God, if you just expect living for God is always going to be just the easiest path, then you're never going to take a stand for God. Like if you're just always striving to do what's easiest, what's convenient, what works best for you, then you're probably never going to take a stand for God because taking a stand for God requires some dedication. It requires a bit of discomfort. It requires you to rise above the odds. So you need to expect that so that you're not just always looking for the easy path. 
And there can be a lot of political pressure. There's going to be a lot of social pressure. Just imagine being in that room where Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are. And all the counselors. I mean, think about in your job, right? Or in your business. You know, you kind of keep up appearances. You want people to think of you a certain way. Think about in your family where you have a certain image. You don't want people to think of you that way. That's what this situation is. This is a situation where it's public. Everyone, if they take this stand, everyone's going to know. Right? Because you may take the stand privately and you say, you know, I, well, me, I believe these things. You know, I'll never change on these things. But you don't want anyone else to know. That's not taking a bold stand. This is saying, this is where they are amongst a lot of people, high-ranking officials, um, because oftentimes people that are in high-ranking positions, they have a lot of influence, but unfortunately they don't take the stands that they need to because of polit political pressure, um, and they kind of buckle. So there can be a lot of pressure to conform to, whether it's physical persecution, it might be social pressure, you know, if you think of peer pressure, family pressure, financial pressure. Now, are you willing to take, lose the job for doing what's right? A lot of people have less, uh, lost their job. And you think of Israel Folau, right? Israel Folau lost his job for taking the stand. That's a good example to, to all of us. Um, even authority pressure, when you're actually brought under authority and uh, you have to answer for what the positions you take or what you have done. Now, how were they able to do that just under such short notice? Well, they had strong convictions, didn't they? Because remember, if, if they were called to this meeting and they had time to think about it, I would think they probably wouldn't have even gone if they had time to think about it. But why in the heat of the moment were they able to take this bold stand for God? It's because their strong convictions were already there. Now, in order for you to have strong convictions, you need to have knowledge. You need to know what you believe, why you believe it, so that the strong convictions are there. You can't just hope for the best when tough times come that you're going to last. You need to be ready for it. That's why even in Daniel, he purposed in his heart, he was ready for it. And I'm sure these men were ready for it too. That's why they said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter, O king. Now, the last one we want to look at is... The lion's den. So sometimes people get confused with the lions. I, you know, I would always get confused with, in the book of Daniel, you think, I know people are thrown into something, but I can't remember whether was it the three friends thrown into the lion's den because they didn't want to, you know, pray to something. You know, you, sometimes you get, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It's like, you got to think like, wait, was that was Daniel? No, it wasn't Daniel in the fire. It's the three men. But were the three men in the fire thrown in because they were praying publicly or were they thrown in because of the statue? Sometimes you get those kids, because they, they're both thrown into something. So Daniel gets his time, right, to be thrown into something. This time he's thrown into the lion's den. But this story happens a lot later. And I think the reason why, one reason why this happens a lot later, because it's, I think it's showing us that Daniel took a stand for God, not only when he was a child. He took a, he took a stand for God when he was older as well. Because now we get, it says here, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. Now, Darius is the king of uh, the Medes, I believe, because I think Cyrus is the king of Persia. So now you've got the Medo-Persian Empire, which is after the Babylonian Empire. So they went into captivity when the Babylonians were, uh, were ruling, remember? So this is now many years later. Daniel has grown up. So the example to us is, you need to take a stand not only when you're young, but also when you're old. Because what happens sometimes in, 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 in the Christians that you see today? And when I was in youth group, when I was in uni, man, I was, doing, I was doing all the ministries, right? Doing this ministry, that ministry. I was so active in uni. Then you get married, right? Are you willing? You get to work, right? The fiery furnace. You still willing to take a stand when you're at work? And then you get older, right? Oh, that's what the kids do. The kids get in all those ministries. So Daniel is showing us the example of when he was young, he took the stand. Even when he's old, he took the stand. And you know why it's even more important when you're old to take a stand for God? Because generally when you're older, you are, you're progressed more in life. You have more experience, right? You have more influence. Generally, it's older people that are in positions of more authority and influence. And if we just slowly, if they took the stand when they were young, when nobody knew them, 
and now everybody knows them and they don't take the stand, how sad is that? Right? Not only do you have, may maybe you have more influence at work, maybe you have more influence in society, maybe you have more influence now in your family. Right? Because when you're a child, who do you influence? Maybe your siblings? But when you're a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and you are not taking the stand, you're not bold in your convictions, you influence a lot more of your family who are looking to you as a respected elder. So that's why we need to take a stand, not only when we're young, but when we're old. Over these three presidents. So this is now a different government system now, because it's a different kingdom. Over these three presidents, so Darius wants to set up 120 princes. And he's going to then set up over these three princes, or over these 120 princes, three presidents. So there's going to be a president, I guess, over 40 of each of the princes, right? This is his government. And it says, of whom Daniel was the first. So he's saying Daniel was preferred of the first of these three presidents who are going to be over these kingdoms, or over these princes. So he's, he's a man of very big authority now, right? And that's why it's so great that he's taking this stand. It's very encouraging. That the princes might give accounts unto them and the king should have no damage. So these princes and presidents are looking after the king's kingdom, right? Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes. So he's saying then, not only was Daniel the first of the three presidents, he's saying Darius thought, hey, you know what? I might just make Daniel the one that's even over the presidents and over the 120, right? He's going to put him in charge at the very top, right? Underneath the king. Because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes. So just think about Daniel's position right now. It would be like if you were the, you know, the prime minister, you were the right-hand man under the prime minister, where you basically took care of everything and he was just like the face of authority. That's the position that Daniel is in. And that is the environment and the position that Daniel does what we are about to read through. Then the president and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not, they, they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So this is why it's so important that your testimony is blameless, so that the only thing people can have against you is what you believe. So it's the same with Daniel. Daniel had such a good testimony. He wasn't sinless because there's, a just, there's no just man upon the earth. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. But he had a blameless testimony. Nobody could accuse him of any wrongdoing. And, and see, it's the president, the three presidents and the 120 princes that are all against Daniel, right? Because he's the one being put in charge. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. <clears throat> then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, <coughs> King Darius, live forever. So remember, this is a different king now. This is not the king of Babylon anymore, Nebuchadnezzar. This is King Darius. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the councils and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of anything of a man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So what are they saying? These 123 people get together and there's a conspiracy now to say, hey, we're going to conspire to put in a law to get Daniel in trouble. So what do they do? They go to the king and they say, king, let's make it a law that for the next 30 days, nobody can pray to any other God except you. And the fact that it's a temporary law, it, to me, like what that, it's like what, what I think of when I think of this temporary law is that like these wicked people, they just put laws in place. They don't care. They don't actually care about the cause. They're just putting these laws in place sometimes to, to bind Christians' hands, to bind us, right? To, to put us in a position where we're breaking the law because, you know, if they really cared about this, why not just make it permanent? Right? So they're just, making it, they're just making it temporary so they can get Daniel in trouble. Right? Now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. So what is that? So the law, how the law worked in the Medo-Persian Empire is if the king decreed something and he signed it into law, not even the king could undo that anymore. Right? So that if they get the king's buy-in to sign this law, they don't know why they want this law, 
Because remember, the king liked Daniel, but the king doesn't know why they're trying to put this law into place. So they trick the king into putting this law into place and he can't even change it himself. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Look at this. Now, when Daniel knew that this writing was signed, so you see how Daniel didn't do what he's about to do ignorantly. He knew what I'm about to do is breaking the law of the land. But when the law of the land tells you to sin, you break that law. That's a law you break, right? Because we always submit to the higher authority. That's why we will always preach the gospel. We will always read the Bible. We will always gather as a church. And we have to, even if it is illegal, right? Because we have to do what's right by God, not what's right by man. We submit to the government in so much that it doesn't oppose God. But once we are now being told to oppose God, like if somebody outlaws prayer, you keep praying. You break that law. And that's what's happening here. Prayer is outlawed to the true and living God. Daniel knows this. He knows the position he's in. He knows that this writing is signed. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber. So not only did Daniel know that what he was doing was illegal, he did it publicly. Isn't that amazing? Because often what happens with Christians, it's like we kind of think, when something's illegal, man, we, we better go underground and things like And I'm not saying that, you know, it's always wise to always do things publicly, right? Because sometimes you've got to think about how it affects your family and stuff like that. But this is what Daniel did, right? What Daniel did is he did it publicly, illegally. He went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So even though he knew it was illegal, he had so much to lose, he did it anyway. And he didn't care that people knew. But what's amazing about this, look at what it says here at the end. As he did aforetime. So it wasn't that he did something different now that he's being persecuted. Isn't that what it's like with Christianity today? Now we can't do something, we better go and do it. Right? Oh, we can't go to church, man. Let's now, now let's take the stand. You know, now, now, now that things are happening, laws are being put in place. Now we're going to take the stand. Well, where were we before? We should have already been taking the stand, so that it didn't even come. But even so, see, he's already doing this before. That's why he has the boldness to keep going. We don't want to kid ourselves because remember, we're learning about boldness today. You don't want to kid yourself that if you're not doing it now, that when times get tough, you're going to start doing it. That's why the Bible says, if you have, if you have uh, run with the footmen and they've wearied you, how are you going to contend with horses? What is that saying? It's saying if you're trying to run with the people on the ground and you're getting tired, how are you going to run when you've got to run with horses? So it's the same here. If you can't take a stand for God when times are easy, man, how are you going to take a stand for God when times are tough? So now is the time to start practicing. Now is the time to get into the habit of taking a stand for God where it's easy, where you're not going to suffer persecution because you know what? It's going to make it a lot easier when times get rough and you then have to take a stand for God. You've already been doing it. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, This thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. So what is this? See how the king actually liked Daniel. See, even though the king is not saved himself, see, if you have a good testimony at work, you know, you're bold in your stance, but you're doing the right thing, hey, your boss should like you. You know, you shouldn't be at odds with your boss, right? So like here, Daniel's boss liked him. Even when he was a kid, remember the, the guy, Melzar, who was in charge of Daniel, Ananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah? 
They had good favour with him. So taking a bold stand for God doesn't mean that you just step on everyone's toes, that nobody likes you. You know, you're always in your boss's face. You ought to be a blessing to your boss. And you know what? If you're a blessing to your boss, the stand that you take will be even more respected. So here, he has good favour with the king. Right? So that's why the king, when he finds out, ah, oh, like this is how this law, you know, this law actually affects Daniel, he's, he's, he's upset with what he's done. And he's, now he's trying to figure out is there a way to get Daniel out of this mess? And he said, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So you can see the sort of impact that Daniel had on the king, that the king, when he found out Daniel was in trouble, he's staying up all night thinking like, man, how do I get around this law? Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute with the king establisheth may be changed. Then the king commanded... And they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. I just think it's interesting that in those days, you know, because they don't have TV and Facebook and YouTube, you know, today it might say like, and then, you know, the king didn't check his Facebook feed, didn't turn on YouTube, you know, but this one, it's like he didn't have like players come in and play instruments for him, you know, <laughs> he didn't, it turned off the music, turned off the stereo, turned off the TV, he couldn't sleep. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. I always find the story of the fiery furnace a lot more extreme than the lion's den because the lion's den you could kind of say well maybe he was thrown in there and the lions weren't hungry or you know maybe he kind of patted them and made friends with them but so you, you know people can say okay maybe there's a way you can get around the lion's den I think they, they you can see that they could because when they throw in the other guys later the lions devour them right so they're obviously hungry and ferocious but you know it, it, it sort of seems like there's more of an out there whereas like with the fiery furnace it's like you know you're not escaping that if you're thrown into a fiery furnace something supernatural has to happen in order for you to to do, get out of that <clears throat> should take daniel up out of the dead so daniel was taken up out of the dead no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his god so there's that picture of salvation where we believe in god we will be spared from judgment and the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused daniel and they cast them into the den of lions them their children their wives and their lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den <coughs> then king darius wrote unto all people nations and languages that dwell in all the earth peace be multiplied unto you i make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the god of daniel for he is the living god and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end he delivereth and rescueth and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who hath delivered daniel from the power of the lions so this daniel prospered in the reign of darius and in the reign of cyrus the persian so what's some lessons we learn here in daniel chapter 6 well the elder believers need to continue standing strong we show that we see that daniel's life not only from young to old he took a stand for god and like i said it's important for people in who are older to take that stand because generally when you're older you have more influence you have more impact on society so those are the people we need to take a stand now also we see here you know that daniel lived a blameless life because you know what in your life you can't control people from attacking you 
You know, whether you don't take the stand for God, you know, and you are not bold in your faith, people are still going to ridicule you when they find out or find out what you believe. You know, they're going to say, oh, you know, you go to church, you're a holy, 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 holy person, you know. Yeah, are you sure you have people say that to you? You know, you can't stop people from attacking you, from saying things. So you may as well just be bold about it, right? So because people are going to attack you anyway, you may as well be bold about it and be blamed. So you can't control, you can't stop people from persecuting you for believing what you believe. But you can, you can focus on living a godly life. That you can control. And if you live that godly, ni- godly life, your boldness in the faith will increase, and it'll be more effective for you as well remember daniel as well because it was already a habit for him to do because he was already doing it when times got tough it was a lot easier as well and the last thing i want you to think about (coughs) is if you remember daniel chapter one there was him and his three friends and then in daniel chapter three the three friends stood together But here, Daniel was standing alone. So like we talked about expecting persecution, expecting sometimes that it's not going to be easy, you've got to expect sometimes that when you take a stand for God, sometimes you're going to be all by yourself. But that doesn't mean you're alone, even though you're by yourself, because why? God was with Daniel. So you see, we can see Daniel took that stand, and it's encouraging that, hey, even though he was by himself, the only one taking that stand. He wasn't alone because God was with him. So I want to just read as a final thought Ephesians chapter 6, and then we'll end here. So Ephesians chapter 6 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, may God help us to take a bold stand. And hopefully this, these stories from Daniel encourage us, they teach us, and they help us when, you know, for you to prepare next time you need to take a bold stand, you're ready. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for the example of Daniel. Uh, Lord, always when I read through these stories, especially with the fiery furnace, furnace, it just gives me chills, Lord, that they were so bold in their stance, standing in that crowd amongst people, I'm sure they were worried. Of, you know, probably, you know, we would often be worried about what these people think. But Lord, these people cared not for what the world thought. They cared not for what the king thought. They only cared about what you thought. And I just pray, Lord, that this example would resonate with us, and that we would take that bold stand for you in our lives. So we thank you, Lord, for this example. Uh, we thank you for your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.